welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Beyond the Big Five, Favorite Animals from Southern Africa. Presented by NADHAB Expedition Leader, Lorraine Doyle. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you for being here with us today. Take it away, Lorraine. Hi, Rob. Thanks very much for that. Um, and yeah, um, excited to be back and um, sharing another webinar um, with everyone. So today I, um, I decided that because it was Valentine's Day coming up, um, hence the hearts on the on the elephants, which is clearly one of my favorites. Um, I thought that I would go on a journey of some of my favorite animals um, using the only structure I've used is kind of going from A to A to Z, as we say here, or A to Z. Um, so yeah, let's um, we'll sort of dive in. And what I'll do is just go through some of the reasons why um, these animals of, you know, these various animals um, are important to me um, and perhaps, and also some facts about them and, and why um, they, um, they mean a lot to me. Um, let's just see if I can drive this, sorry. Doesn't want to. Okay. Sorry, having a few. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, so the for anyone who doesn't know, um, that's me in the middle, and with some of my amazing colleagues uh, from the Dikwe Safari Lodge, which is where we go on our secluded South Africa safari. Um, so, yeah, just to contextualise. And then, starting at A. So this um, bird is an arrow-marked babbler, and um, this is another picture of him, perhaps giving slightly more of a clue as to why they're known as babblers. Um, so they're very highly gregarious birds. Um, you'll often find them in smallish flocks, sometimes 10, 15 birds, um, and they are incredibly raucous all day. Um, it generally sounds like there's some sort of a fight going on, but actually there's not. Um, they are just extremely um, vocal in their communications with each other um, and also very, <clears throat> excuse me, demonstrative uh, in terms of the way that they, as you can see the one in the picture here, they kind of um, sit with their wings out. Um, and they are what we know, know as cooperative breeders. Um, so essentially, all the birds within the little family flock, if you will, are involved in raising um, in raising the chicks. Um, so it's a very good strategy um, if you want a high survival rate. And as a result of that, um, they're actually really quite successful. Um, there are other species of babblers. You get pied babblers, which are black and white, um, but they're less, they're not quite as noisy as these chaps. And um, I also really like the um, arrow uh, markings on their chest, which is sort of where they get their name from, those white feathers. Um, and I've always thought of them, um, if you thought about um, sort of old prison garb that always had arrows on it, um, these were kind of the, these were the noisy prison birds. Um, so those are arrow marked babblers for A. Then on to some of, um, a, there's a couple of different species of bee eaters. Um, this one is a little bee eater. Uh, this is the world's smallest bee eater. Um, and as their name suggests, and I think I have mentioned in other webinars, um, they do eat bees. Um, not only bees, however, they, if you have a look at their long, narrow bill, um, they will take any sort of insect. That's a very much an insectivorous bill. Um, but they have a very special strategy for, um, for dispatching bees. They'll actually pull the sting out of the bee. Um, before they will consume it, so that they actually don't get stung um, as they're as they're eating it. Um, and this is 
this is a swallow-tailed um, bee eater. You can't really see the, the tail here, but it has quite a distinctive V in it, um, which is where it gets the name swallow-tailed from. Um, and this is the only one of the relatively small bee eaters in Southern Africa um, that has this combination of green and yellow, like you get in your um, little bee eater, but combined with this beautiful, beautiful turquoise um, as well. Um, not that widely distributed, um, and it's one of the birds that we're fortunate enough to see when we go to Maritaba uh, on secluded South Africa. Um, this was where this photograph was taken. Um, actually, the one of the previous one as well, um, of the little bee eater, that was also taken there, um, but they have a, a wider distribution range um, than the swallowtailed. Um, but also have this beautiful um, flight pattern where they'll hawk insects out the air. So you'll see them, they'll fly up, um, they'll catch an insect, and very often they'll come back to the same perch. Um, that is unless you've told your guests that that's exactly what they're going to do. So keep your camera focused on that branch because it will come back. Um, and uh, somehow along the line on a number of occasions, they seem to have missed their cue because on those occasions, they decide that they're actually flying off to another branch. Um, but on occasion, they do come back um, to the same branch, which is how I got these photographs. Um, but just very colorful birds um, and also have, I mean, none of um, our birds are true songbirds um, in the same way that birds in Europe are songbirds, um, but they do have, um, bee eaters do have actually quite, um, quite pretty calls. So, B then, um, for cheetahs. Um, as with all things, when you sit going through an alphabet, um, there are so many things that, you know, um, you could you could use, I guess. I mean, I was sitting there thinking, well, I really like civets as well. But I think cheetahs are perhaps something that more people can identify with. Um, and they just, because of their um, incredibly endangered status, um, I think... Um, and the amount of work I do with them um, on the reserve where I work when I'm not um, guiding for NATHAB, um, I've got a very special place in my heart for these cats. Um, critically endangered um, because of genetic bottleneck, um, but also because of habitat loss. Um, and also because if you think about other big predators, lions, leopards, um, Cheetahs are, by comparison, quite a frail um, cat, and as a result, um, are often killed by other predators, um, including lions, uh, leopards, and also hyenas um, will also take out cheetahs. Um, so, I think possibly that's why I have something of a of a soft spot for them. Um, they're also very unique cats, um, and although this is not the greatest photograph in the world. Um, it's just to illustrate a point at the size of their paws. Um, so this is a youngster. This is a cub, um, probably about eight, eight, nine months old. Um, and cheetahs have very, very long paws um, for a cat. So normally, if you look at a cat track, um, it's quite a round track. If you look at lions or leopards, um, if you look at a cheetah's track, um, it's actually a lot more elongated. Um, and although we say that they don't climb very well, and this one's actually cheating, there was some protective wire on this tree to stop elephants from debarking it. And the cheetahs had learned how to climb it. Um, but they can climb, um, but their claws don't fully retract, and their claws are quite a lot more blunt um, than something like a lion or a leopard. Um, and so they definitely act more like runner's spikes um, rather than being able to grip onto um, a tree um, in order to climb it. But cubs are quite good at it um, and they will um, not that gracefully climb up and down trees. 
Um, the other reason for this photograph is that this cub has still got the remains of what we call its mantle on its back. Um, and that's that whitish gray fur that you can see um, above the spots on its back. They lose that um, when they get to just over a year. Um, and we think it's a protective mechanism in that um, when they're very young, there's a very distinctive, from a distance especially, dark bottom and then this whitish mantle. And we think it gives them, uh, the reason for it is it does make them look quite a lot like honey badgers. And a honey badger is um, a very feared animal because it's so ferocious for its size. And we think that maybe it's a protective strategy for these cats um, when they are um, when they are youngsters. Um, so pretty unique um, in that regard. Then I thought for D, I'd use um, a, do a dove, um, and this is an emerald spotted wood dove. Now most people when we're thinking about birds and wanting to go birding in Africa, I think doves um, and pigeons um, are probably the last thing on anyone's um, list. But actually we have some really, really beautiful doves and pigeons in Southern Africa. Um, so uh, this one has got this beautiful um, emerald um, splash on its, on its wings. Um, it's also one of my favorite birds because when we do bird banding, um, sometimes um, for research purposes, um, and you catch them and miss, you catch birds and mist nets to do this, um, some of the birds can actually be really quite, um, quite aggressive, um, understandably so. Um, but these little emerald spotted wood doves, the extent of their aggression is to go, Um, which is not their normal call, um, but that's literally all that they utter um, while you kind of get them out of the net and put the bird band on them. Um, so we also get um, turquoise spotted wood doves, um, much less frequently seen, um, and then a variety of other doves, um, which are quite a lot smaller um, than our pigeons. Um, and some of our pigeons that we get in Southern Africa as well are beautiful shades of green and um, orange. Um, so very much not like the ones, um, you know, that, that tend to exist in urban areas and sometimes um, tend to call, become something of a pest. Um, so these, um, these little uh, emerald spotted wood doves definitely don't fall into that category. You can see it's got a slightly more robust bill um, than the bee eaters. And that's because these, um, these are mainly seed eaters. Um, so they eat small seeds, um, grass seed, seed that they'll pick up. Um, so not the sort of stout um, cracking seed bill that you might expect to find on something like a parrot, um, but still a heavier bill than you would have on an insect eating, on an insect eating bird. And then probably uh, one of my favorites. So when I was putting this presentation together, um, I'm often asked by people, so what's your favorite animal? And I've always, and still do, battle to answer it. Um, and I kind of realized that that was because there are just so many things about so many animals um, that I just find truly incredible and remarkable. Um, and so it's a really, really difficult choice. But there is something about elephants that um, ever since I was little, I've just found um, quite, um, there's just something really um, relatable in a way, for want of a better expression, um, in terms of elephants. I think the way that they interact um, with each other, um, the level of parental, um, particular well, maternal care um, that mothers show for their calves, um, and also the way in which aunts um, will also 
um, plays such a pivotal role in looking after um, baby elephants. Obviously, as in most um, animal species, the males pay, play very little role really in the, um, in the raising or in any of the life of, um, of the overall herd and very strongly matriarchal society. Um, so this little chap, this was actually taken at um, Mala Mala Game Reserve on secluded, one of the secluded South Africa trips. And this is a very, very young baby um, elephant. You can see if you have a look on the top of his head, um, there's still a lot of very dark black fluffy hair. Um, and he can literally fit underneath mom's belly. Um, so when an elephant is around um, or has those kind of characteristics, pretty much know that this um, little elephant is three months, around three months, um, and definitely not more than that. Um, they also tend to, when they're very small like this, you'll often see them. It's a bit like you would think of a, a human baby with a dummy. Um, you'll see them sucking on their trunk. Um, and that's what this little one had been had been doing. Um, but yeah, a very, very cute little um, little elephant baby there. And then boys will be boys. And this is the kind of behavior that starts when they get to teenagers. Um, particularly, I mean, the, you will get a little bit of um, this kind of jostling between females as well, but this is much more typical of young males. Um, and this is all about starting to um, develop the, the skills that will allow them um, to ultimately one day become a dominant bull. So they have these kind of sparring matches with each other um, and they will push each other around um, quite literally sometimes for hours. Um, so it is an element of play, um, but as they get older, um, it definitely starts to become a little more serious. Um, and what's also quite interesting to watch is sometimes the older females get really frustrated with these youngsters playing like this, um, and they will trumpet at them. Um, and you can literally see that this is a reprimand. Um, and that really you're now being way too boisterous around the younger ones, um, you're making a noise, um, you're causing chaos, it's just time to stop now. Um, and generally speaking, um, once one of them, you know, the, the, fem the older females has made that clear, and these youngsters will often um, calm down um, a bit. So yeah, very, very interesting to watch. Um, but yeah, very kind of like I said, quite relatable in that you can relate to this in terms of how we, um, as humans, um, tend to behave as, as teenagers. Um, and then other just amazing things um, about elephants. This one was taken at Marataba um, in the river there. But I've actually also seen elephants um, swimming across the Zambezi River in Zimbabwe, um, which is a huge and powerful river. Um, and taking quite young calves with them um, across to some of the islands um, in the middle of the river. And obviously, as this one is doing, um, their mouth is below water level. Um, and so their trunk becomes a snorkel. Um, and they can actually go for quite long distances like this. Um, and unlike hippos, which cannot swim, um, elephants, despite their bulk, elephants can actually swim. So their feet do not have to be in contact with the bottom um, of the river or the body of water that they are in. Whereas um, hippos will drown in deep water because they have to have, be able to have contact with the bottom um, and then be able to surface. Um, so they, are, they don't have the ability to swim, but elephants certainly do. Um, and I've watched mom elephants literally helping little ones, almost like nudging them along um, with these and these tiny little trunks just above the water level um, as they kind of grow across the river. Um, so yeah, just very, very special animals. Um, 
So this is a um, fork tail drongo. And the reason I've got a fork tail drongo here is, is that they are just incredibly clever birds. So they are one of the best mimics um, that we have in Southern Africa. Um, they mimic other birds. They mimic the alarm call of um, small mammals like mongooses. Um, and they will follow around herds of elephants or other animals. And as the insects get flushed up, these guys will come along and um, take the insects. But they're not above a little bit of um, stealing. And so they will sometimes wait until um, an, an animal, a little mongoose or something has got uh, something that they want that they think looks like quite a nice meal. Um, and they will give a warning call for a predator. Um, and the mongoose's instinct is to drop whatever it is that it was about to eat and run for cover. And along swoops the forktail drongo and comes and says, thanks very much, and um, takes the food and off he flies. So in the Shangon language, which is a language um, of the um, area closest to the Kruger National Park, um, they're actually known as Mantengu, um, which translated means um, the one who is wise about the bush. Um, and I've always thought that's a really lovely name for them and a very appropriate name for them um, because they really are um, uh, very wise about the bush um, and how they go about getting their um, their meals. They can be confused with another bird um, in Southern Africa called um, a black flycatcher, Southern black flycatcher. But what's distinctive about these birds is their bright red eye. Um, so whereas the flycatcher has a black eye um, and, a, and a less heavy bill. But the very diagnostic thing about a forktail drongo is um, the, the bright red eye. So Mantengu, the one who's very wise and very clever. So G had to be giraffe. Um, this is a, a very young giraffe um, with ossicones, with hair on the top that looks like paintbrushes. Um, so these will, over time, those hairs will get more compressed. Um, and if it's a male, they'll actually eventually get worn away completely um, by the sparring that takes place when giraffes spar. But um, they've always got pretty um, fluffy ossicones, but this, this one had particularly um, fluffy ossicones, which I just thought were really um, quite... Um, Quite amazing. So these animals um, are one of my favorites, I think, simply because they are just such a unique animal. Um, you know, with these incredibly long legs, long necks, um, this kind of fifth long, narrow face, which allows them to get into these thorn bushes, um, a, a an incredibly long tongue. Um, which is black to protect it from being sunburned, um, extraordinarily long eyelashes to protect their eyes from, um, again, from being poked with thorns, um, and just a whole suite of um, physiological adaptations that allow them to um, survive, um, you know, whether that be the way that they're able to control their blood pressure when going from, you know, drinking to standing up, um, incredibly tight fascia, um, connective tissue around um, the muscles in their legs, which facilitate the return of blood to their heart. Um, so just um, this whole, mm. yeah, a whole unique set of um, behaviors and, and physiological adaptations um, that I've all just always thought made them um, really special. Also the fact that they're the world's largest mammal pollinator. Um, so we know that there are many rodents that assist with pollinating plants, um, but giraffe are probably the biggest mammal pollinator we know of. Um, so they will often stick their head into trees, particularly thorn trees when they're flowering. They'll get pollen all over their faces on the ossicones and then they'll move to the next tree. 
Um, and as a result, they'll then take the pollen, obviously with them and deposit it in the next tree. Um, I love this photograph. So this was taken at Mala Mala. Um, this was an incredibly small baby giraffe. Um, you probably can't see it on this picture. You may be able to, but it actually still had its umbilical cord. Um, and what was just so amazing to see is when they're little like this, they prance around um, all over the place. So he was kicking up his heels and running around in circles. Um, and obviously when they get older, because of these quite long and ungainly legs, you know, they don't do that anymore. Um, but very, very pay, um, playful when they're young. Um, and that's what this little giraffe was doing. Um, he was having an absolutely great time. It was quite a cloudy, um, cool day. It had been raining. Um, and yeah, he sort of literally had all of the joys of spring. Um, so yeah, very, um, very playful little, little giraffe. Another reason I really love giraffes is they're incredibly photogenic in sunset photographs. Um, there's just something about a sunset with a giraffe in it um, that for me has always has always been special. Um, I think this was taken at Medique Game Reserve um, on secluded South Africa. And then H um, for hyenas, um, both spotted and brown. Um, I know Disney has given these guys a really bad rap, um, but it's an uncalled for rap. Uh, these are really some of the most intelligent carnivores um, alive. Um, and as you can see, um, this I just thought this youngster was suckling um, and it was just really sweet just seeing that the mom had kind of fallen asleep over the top of over the top of this um, this little one. So this was uh, if you can see, the youngster is quite dark on the bottom, um, sort of on its torso, but the head is still quite light, um, or has gone lighter, should I say. So they start life completely black, They're absolutely pitch black. And then as they get older, um, they start to go lighter from the head down. So this one is probably about three or four months old, uh, maybe a little older. Um, but that's when they start to get this coloration change that starts to happen. So they lose the pitch black, um, which we think may have some form of protection because they obviously are um, born in burrows. So they'll often be in sort of disused aardvark burrows. Um, and when they're pitch black, um, any predator sort of looking down there visually um, would probably have a a more difficult time spotting them than if they were lighter colored. Um, but as they get older, um, so they start to go lighter from the head down. And I just think they look like Mickey Mouse. Um, I just think they're incredibly cute. Um, very sophisticated social structure, um, very dominant matriarchal line. Um, male hyenas have a very tough time. Um, an adult male is lower ranked in hyena society than a than a, a tiny um, female um, pup. So, um, but yeah, I just think that um, for so many reasons, um, not least that they're photogenic, um, particularly when they're little, um, makes them very, very appealing. So these are spotted hyenas. And then these are brown hyenas. Um, look incredibly different. Um, not as strictly carnivorous as spotted hyenas. They still have powerful jaws, but by no means um, anywhere near as powerful as spotted hyenas. Um, they're more omnivorous, um, so they will eat fruits um, and, and other things as well. Um, and in parts of Namibia um, in the Namib Desert, um, they're actually known as Thrantlopus, which basically means sort of beach comas, um, because they will go down onto the beach, onto the beaches there, um, and they will pick up whatever um, the tide might have brought in, um, be that, you know, fish, crabs, um, whatever else they can find. Um, so better adapted to more arid environments than spotted hyenas. 
um, this was taken at Medique Game Reserve, um, and this was a pretty cool interaction that we were uh, very fortunate uh, fortunate to witness. So there were quite a few of them interacting, um, and this is sort of a dominance a dominance display from the one that's standing up and the one um, that's sort of half lying down. That's much more of a submissive posture. Um, so yeah, there's some some social um, some social interaction going going on there. They are also matriarchal, um, not quite so strongly, but this could well be um, a dominance interaction between a male and a female. Um, I just love this picture because this is a youngster who looked like he'd been caught with his paws in the cookie jar. Um, that face kind of just says it all. It's like I got caught doing something I shouldn't have. Um, but you can see they've got this really quite unique um, striping on their legs. Um, this very long mane and coat, um, which obviously spotted spotted hyenas don't. Um, Medique is quite unique in that it has a population of brown and spotted hyenas. Um, often spotted hyenas are will dominate um, brown hyena species because brown are are less aggressive um, um, and just not as strongly. Um, they're just not as strong physically either. Um, but yeah, so we've um, seen them at Medique and then we also get them at, um, at Maritaba um, when we go on secluded South Africa. But so there are other species of hyena in, in Africa. Um, there's striped hyena, um, things like aardwolf. Um, but yeah, these are the kind of ones that we see in, in Southern Africa. So people would probably look at me and go Lorraine how can an impala be one of your favorites I mean they're so common it's frightening um, but they really are and the reason is is that if you think about the fact that they are so common why are they so common and the reason they're so common is they're so successful um, and there are many reasons for that um, he's demonstrating one and that is that they have they're mixed feeders, so they don't just need grass to survive or trees or browse. They can do both. Um, and so that strategy um, has enabled them to survive in environments where strict grazers or browsers may not. Um, and then also their very clever breeding strategy of dropping all the young at once um, in around November, December, flooding the market so that predators there's no way as predators can eat all of the lands that are born at the same time. Um, and as a result, despite high predation levels, they still get, um, they still increase in number. Um, so that's one of the reasons. Um, and I also just think they're incredibly beautiful antelope, um, but you are very, very well adapted to their environment. Then Jay, uh, Jackal. So this is a blackback jackal. Um, we get two species in Southern Africa. Um, I don't have a photograph, um, or I couldn't find one easily, um, of a side striped jackal. Um, but this is the more common one. Um, I just think they've got incredibly beautiful coats. Um, and they really are important. Yes, they are scavengers. Um, although they are omnivorous, I mean, they will, and they will kill for themselves. They'll kill rodents, birds. Um, but they will obviously scavenge. So they're part of the cleanup crew. Um, and without them um, to help clean up carcasses, um, a little bit like vultures help clean up carcasses and hyenas, um, the, the environment would be a, um, a lot more prone to disease um, than, than it is. Um, so very fox-like. Um, in their appearance, you know, this kind of long snout, um, but these beautiful sort of golden amber brown eyes. Um, and yeah, just their call as well for me. Um, they have a very, blackback jackals especially, have a very distinctive call. Um, and it's one of the calls for me that has always been very evocative of, of, of being in, in Africa. Um, so kind of reasons why I really like them. And then K, um, this is a black shouldered or thing, I think it's now black winged kite. Sorry, they keep changing the names. Um, so one of our smaller, smaller raptors. Um, and 
It's one of, so none of the birds that we have can actually hover um, like North American hummingbirds. Um, but these kites can actually, what we get, they, it's called aerial perching. Um, so they can literally stay in one place um, and, and it appears to be hovering, but it's technically not because apparently they can't actually move backwards in that position. Um, but yeah, they will stay there for prolonged periods of time, just watching, waiting. So they're rodent specialists and you can see they've got quite powerful talents for a small bird. Um, and they will hover there and um, when they see something, they'll dive down and catch it. And they're pretty successful hunters. Um, but just, you know, it's all, also really, really pretty, um, pretty raptors um, and very successful. Um, quite widely distributed within the subregion. So owl had to be leopard, um, not lion. <laughs> For me, leopards are the ultimate um, predator in terms of cats. Um, there is something just um, so sleek about leopards, um, their method of their stealth hunting, um, their incredible strength for their size. Um, I think um, this, all of these photo, oh, that first photograph was taken at Maratala. This was taken at Mala Mala. Um, this is actually a leadwood tree, which has got incredibly hard wood. Um, and this leopard literally went straight up that tree, um, just holding on and pulling itself up with its, through its sheer strength, muscle strength, was able to get right up that tree. Um, really quite incredible to witness. Um, so for me, yeah, just the ultimate predator. Um, and also they, they're just incredibly photogenic as well. Um, but there's something incredibly aloof about them. Um, um, aloof, they're also very inquisitive. I've got photographs of them. Um, I think perhaps, you know, the proverbial curiosity killed the cat. Um, sticking their noses into um, tree trunks and all sorts of things and um, things that lions generally don't um, don't do that um, that leopards are just really adept at um, and then also they're incredibly beautiful markings um, just obviously the, the the rosette patterning on them but then this beautiful sort of black and white necklace around their necks um, just stunningly beautiful cats and then People are probably going, oh my word, what is that? Um, so this is a monitor lizard. Um, this is a rock monitor. Um, and the next one is a Nile monitor. Um, so the Nile monitor gets quite a lot bigger, um, is um, less arboreal, um, is more aquatic. Um, so for anyone who's kind of knows anything about um, things like Komodo dragons, these guys are related, um, a lot smaller, um, definitely nowhere near as fierce, um, but are part of a venom clade. Um, so amongst most lizards do not have forked tongues. Um, these do. Um, so they definitely, um, along with their relatives, which are part of the same family Varanidae, um, the Komodo dragons, um, they do actually have a venom. Um, but I mean, in terms of any danger to humans, um, these animals here don't really pose any danger, certainly not from venom, um, but you can have a look. I mean, they've got very um, strong claws and also the Nile monitor um, or the water monitor has got an incredibly powerful tail. Um, so yeah, if you wouldn't want to be, um, you wouldn't want to get a swipe from the tail. Um, so, but just um, really attractive, I've always thought they're really attractive reptiles. Um, also, they have this amazing strategy of opening up a, um, an active termite mound, burying their, or laying their eggs in there. Um, termites will close it up um, and it acts as a perfect incubator because it's kept at a constant um, about 36 degrees centigrade. Um, so pretty, pretty, pretty cool lizards. Then M for um, Inyala. Um, so this is a, a, a Inyala male, um, really beautiful antelope, um, sometimes get confused with kudu. 
Um, smaller than Kuru don't have such spectacularly spiral horns, but they have this amazing mane almost. Um, and very different when they're young, um, the males. Um, so this one here, this is actually a very young male, um, looks like a female. Uh, apart from the fact that it's actually got two little horn buds which are starting to erupt. But until they're 14 months old, the males look um, exactly like this one, which is how the females look. Um, and then as they reach sexual maturity, then um, they then get this beautiful dark chocolate coat um, with these sort of um, yellow leggings, if you want. Um, and then these white, very prominent white facial markings. They also have a very, very unique way of establishing dominance. I mean, they will lock horns if needed. And their horns, you can see here, um, the white tips, they are really quite sharp. But they, they have this elaborate dance where they'll do this very stiff-legged walk and they'll puff up their mane and their tail um, and they kind of parade around each other. Um, it's only if that doesn't allow them one or to establish dominance um, that they will perhaps then get a little more aggressive. Um, but they're definitely much more um, likely to try and resolve it without any form of active aggression, um, unlike other, um, other species, which will generally um, kind of lock horns and push each other around. Um, so these guys do a much more gracious, um, gracious dance. They also have the greatest sexual dimorphism of any of our antelope. Um, so the female is um, substantially smaller than the male. Um, so, but again, also has this sort of facial markings, um, but just not as pronounced. Um, and they never go that beautiful chocolate color like the males do. This is a, an otter, a Cape Clawless otter. Um, hardly ever seen. Um, this photograph was taken in the Sand River at Mala Mala um, last year um, on a secluded South Africa safari and all the guides, um, whether everybody was ecstatic to actually be so privileged to see these because um, it's not that they're particularly rare, it's just that they're hardly ever seen. Um, so a freshwater otter um and this there were actually three of them two of them stayed around um playing so they'll eat freshwater crabs and they'll eat fish um so but yeah just a very very special sighting um and that's why it had to make it into it had to make it into the list in all of my time working um both as an environmentalist and and as a guide um, I've only ever seen these um, a handful of times out, um, out in the wild. Then P had to be this little guy. This is a pearl spotted owlet. Um, very, very tiny, um, but incredibly um, ferocious. Um, also has this very unique set of false eyes, um, which I couldn't find a photo of, but has a set of false eyes on the back of its head. Um, so um, we think that potentially it means that if a predator was approaching from behind, it, it would think that it, you know, it was um, the animal wouldn't be able to get away. But actually, if it's seeing the false eyes, then obviously the bird has got a chance of, of escaping. Um, they have um, an amazing call um, and they will call during the day as well. They sort of have this crescendo call. Um, which is pretty powerful for this very tiny little bird. Um, I must say, this one did not look very comfortably perched. Um, but yeah, you can see the little, obviously where it gets its name, it has all these little white pearl spots um, all over its, um, all over the top of its head. Um, so just a really cute little guy. So I couldn't find anything for Q. So I decided that this was quite unexpected. <laughs> so this was, um, this is the guide's accommodation at um, Mala Mala. And I came round the corner to go into my room 
and um, was somewhat surprised um, to find this quite unexpected guest um, who stayed there for quite some time after I managed, I actually got into my room um, and just stayed there and really was, um, had been sort of browsing, I think, on the, on the fever tree that was there, uh, totally unconcerned by me. But um, yes, it was definitely a quite unexpected um, sighting. Oh, for rhinos, um, this one in particular, extremely special. Um, these are black, this is the black rhino mom and her calf um, at Medique. Um, yeah, special because there's only about 5,000 black rhinos left in the world. Um, so critically endangered. Um, and we very privileged um, to be able to, to see them. And then also slightly more of them still around. Um, these are white rhinos or square-lipped rhinos. Um, and I just love this particular picture because this little baby with his huge feet and had obviously put his nose into the, the sand and so had this whole caked moustache um, of sand all over his nose. Um, it was just too cute. But as you can see, if between the adults, um, the big size difference um, between an adult black rhino and um, an adult white rhino um, to the tune of about a, a ton of weight in difference. Um, so the white rhino is a much, much bigger animal, um, much heavier head, longer head, um, and has this hump on its back, which we call a nuchal hump, which is where they actually, um, all the muscles attach to try and keep that huge header. Um, a much more placid um, animal. Um, black rhinos, because they're much, um, quite a lot smaller, they tend to live in much more wooded environments um, than white rhinos, which live out in the open. Um, and so if you encounter um, or surprise a black rhino, its, it's, it's attitude is, well, the best form of defense is attack. So anybody who's worked in the bush um, or has spent time walking um, in the bush a lot um, has probably even put up a tree by a black rhino at some point um, because they are quite quite grumpy um, if you disturb them unnecessarily. But just incredibly special animals. Um, some of the only remaining species um, a lot of the others, Java and Sumatran, um, other species of rhinos, um, have basically been decimated. Um, and so we're trying very hard in Africa, um, Southern Africa, South Africa in particular, um, to try and conserve these species. Um, but it's not, um, yeah, it's not an easy, it's not an easy job. Um, people are probably going to go again, oh my word, Lorraine, those are squirrels. Um, and yes, these are squirrels, um, but these are quite special squirrels. These are ground squirrels. Um, so live in very hot, arid environments. Um, and this one has partially got its tail up. So what they do in really, really hot weather is they use this as a parasol. So they'll actually fan their tail right up over their body um, and use that to protect them from, from the heat. Um, so found dry arid areas like Medique, um, going right up into the Kalahari and Botswana. Um, so, and as their name suggests, um, these do not grow up, um, they don't climb up trees. They live in burrows underground, um, which obviously enables them to live in hotter areas because below ground, um, you get to a, a point where you have a much more constant temperature. Um, which allows them to survive in these arid environments. But we also do have tree squirrels. Um, and I just thought that these, this particular pair were quite engaging. Um, it was a very, very cold morning. And these two were kind of, the one was still quite curled up, um, but the other one was sort of sprawled out on the tree, um, catching the first kind of rays of the sun. Um, so quite a lot smaller than um, 
than the ground squirrels, um, and obviously um, an, ob an arboreal species as opposed to a ground dwelling species. Um, so when I got to tea, um, I was kind of having to rack my brains a bit. Um, and this is a, a very, very pretty bird. So these are what are known as Cape teals. Um, so they're a type of duck. Um, but they also have this beautiful turquoise iridescence um, or this iridescent speculum in the in their wing um, and also not that commonly encountered. Um, so many of our other duck species are quite common, um, but these ones are um, are less commonly um, less commonly seen and not as not as extensively distributed. So when it came to you, I had a similar problem as I had at Q. And so I decided that I would go with unidentified flying snake. Um, so the snake had actually been caught. This is a uh, dark chanting goshawk. So a type of um, raptor that we get um, in kind of the northern parts of South Africa. Um, and it had actually picked up the snake. Um, which I think may actually have been a yellow-bellied sand snake, um, but couldn't be sure, so it became an unidentified flying snake. But it's quite interesting to have a look at the position of the feet that the, uh, the bird has taken. And it had a bit of a fight trying to control the snake. I mean, it eventually, it eventually dropped down and I think it managed to kill it and start eating it. Um, but I think that the snake had almost at some point, it looked like it had started to wrap itself around the, the raptor's legs a little bit. Um, but yeah, it was quite interesting to see. Um, and these birds are not typically known as snake specialists. Um, there are some of our raptors, things like um, our bachelors um, that are actually snake, snake eagles um, and secretary birds, which will stomp snakes to death. Um, but yeah, it's, was, it was quite unusual to see um, a goshawk like this with, with a snake in its talons. A V, so this is a, um, a violet-backed starling. Um, so it has this unbelievably beautiful, so this is a male. The female has none of these colors. Um, it was a chilly day, and that's why he's so incredibly puffed up, um, this fluffy white, sort of marshmallow in the front, um, and then this beautiful plum violet um, iridescence um, on the back. So yeah, just also an um, insectivorous um, bird. And like all starlings, um, very intelligent. Um, so all of the starlings, um, crows, all corvids, um, very intelligent birds. Um, but yeah, this one, um, he made, he made the list because um, they're just he's just really, really pretty. And then W had to be wild wild dogs, freaking wild dogs. Um, this one was this one was taken at Medique. Um, so again, um, in, endangered animals, um, highly persecuted, um, very, very difficult to keep within game reserves um, because they range over massive distances. Um, they're cursorial predators, which means they run their prey down. Um, and so they need vast areas, um, but just have um, this incredible um, coloration. So all of their coats are different, um, a bit like our fingerprints. And the only thing that they all have is this kind of white fluffy tail. Um, and I think, uh, very, very social. Um, so this is typical of a greeting display um, where they will greet each other. Um, so yeah, very, um, very interactive animals um, and just incredibly beautiful. And then um, we now then we got to X. So X also posed something of a problem. So um, we had to use a little bit of sort of uh, mobile phone language extra cute without the e um so this was just a pride and i think this was the i think it might be the kambula pride at mala mala um, just very very cute little lion cubs um, and then equally cute 
um, a lion, a leopard, um, leopard cub. Um, and then why? Um, yellow-billed hornbill, our southern yellow-billed hornbills, um, mainly because they're just incredibly funny characters. Um, but they also have a very unique breeding strategy um, where the female is sealed in with the, uh, the eggs, sheds all her feathers, um, is fed by the male, um, and then um, she regrows her feathers um, and then she breaks up, was broken out by the male, and then they both feed the chicks until the chicks fledge. Um, so yeah, pretty unique breed, breeding behavior, but they really are comedians of the bush. Um, they get up to all sorts of antics. And then certainly last, but by no means least, at Z, um, zebra. So this is, um, this is the zebra species that we get here in, in Southern Africa, um, a plain zebra. Um, used to be considered that we had the same species up in East Africa, but genetics have proven that it's actually a separate species, um, but they look similar. Um, but yeah, very um, obviously iconic species, I think, um, just because of this um, beautiful black and white patterning, which is um, quite unusual. Um, and a number of thoughts as to why they are that color. Um, one of the most recent ones being that um, biting flies don't actually land on striped surfaces, and so much so that they now make striped horse blankets. Um, but also when they are running in a group, um, it is quite difficult to pick out a single animal. Um, so part, part of it may also be, I mean, they're known as a dazzle of zebra as the collective noun, um, it could well be that it does have an element of predator confusion. Um, so, um, but yeah, so that's how they made it onto the list. And then these are little dwarf mongooses, which despite this very cute and fluffy appearance, um, actually um, are, small, are smallest carnivores and they are pretty ferocious little carnivores. So that's, um, the A to Z of my favorite Southern African animals. So thanks, Rob. Rain, thank you so much. Now, before we start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. All right, let's get to some of these questions. So let's talk about hyenas. Are hyenas distantly related to dogs at all, or are they more related to cats? So they're actually close, they're more closely related to cats than to dogs. Um, but up until, um, I'm trying to think now, it's quite a number of years ago, but they were classified along with dogs at one point, they were in the family Canada. And then when more research started being done, especially by a lady known as Kay, uh, known by the name of Kay Montgomery up in Kenya, um, a lot of her work showed that they are so different that they're actually now in their own family completely. Um, but if you look at the evolutionary history, they are more closely related to cats than dogs. Great. Thank you for addressing that. Um, so how big do the hyenas get? Um, Gosh, I'm not very good in pounds. Um, so a, a female, a large female um, hyena can get up to sort of 60 kilograms. Um, so they can get really quite big. I mean, um, and especially the females of the of spotted hyenas. Um, brown hyenas are a bit smaller, um, but are they, you know, they'd be the size of a I'm trying to think of, I can't even really think of a dog to associate them with, but um, yeah, sort of 60 kilograms. I mean, it's, they're, they're pretty big animals. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so the emerald spotted dove, do we know why uh, or what the purpose is for the green feathers? And are they born green or do they become green as they get older? No, they actually, and it's quite an interesting question because both the males and the females have them. So normally, you know, you would have more coloration or brighter coloration in males for um, display purposes. 
but um, it doesn't seem to be the case in, in emerald spotted wood doves. Um, and actually, I don't, I don't know, and I haven't ever read anywhere um, anything as to why they specifically have those kind of emerald flashes. Um, it doesn't seem to be for display purposes, um, and it doesn't seem to serve any, you know, sort of physiological function. So I think it, there's a little bit of mystery there. Oh, interesting. So do we know what are the ridges on the impala's uh, antler? Um, so the ridges on their horns. Um, so a lot of a lot of antelope here have got those sort of spirals or ridges on their horns. Um, exactly why, I have to be honest, I'm not 100% certain. I do know that the shape means that sometimes when, especially in parlor fight, those horns get locked. Um, but all of our um, antelope here have got horns, um, not antlers, which means that um, inside that kind of ridged, it's actually keratin, so the same stuff as our fingernails, inside there is a bony core which is attached to the skull. Um, so that is just the casing that goes over the top of it. Um, but exactly what those ridges do, um, or if they have a purpose, um, it's not something that I've ever really read anything specifically about. Um, but quite a lot of, of antelope species have got some sort of ridging or spiral um, in their horns. Um, and as I say, it does, it does mean that sometimes these um, animals get their horns locked. Um, but I'll have a look and see if I can find anything else that better explains it. Thank you, Lorraine. So how long are the Nile monitors? Um, so they can grow up to about, um, I'm just, again, I'm really bad, sorry about feet. Um, so they can get to a meter and a half. Um, so pretty, and they, they really are quite bulky. Um, so people often will confuse them as a for a small crocodile um, or a small alligator. Um, so just to give you some sort of comparison that they actually are pretty, pretty, um, pretty hefty. So there's an opening on the side of its head. Is that an ear? Yes, that's so they don't have an external ear pinna like we do. So that's the tympanum. That's the tympanic membrane. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's essentially what um, what would be used for hearing. Correct. And do we know what the monitors eat? Um, yes, so um, they will take things like, um, they'll take eggs, um, rock monitors will take things like small birds, rodents, um, they'll take, um, aquatic, the Nile monitors will take things like aquatic birds. Um, so yeah, they, they're very much a, a sort of a, a carnivorous, they're both quite carnivorous species. Could, They'll could also you... take, I've seen them take snakes as well, actually. I've seen a Nile monitor take a snake. Thank you. All right. So can, can you uh, repeat the name of that little owl again for us? Oh, it's a pearl spotted. And, so and how... as in, sorry? No, that's okay. Please continue. Yeah. So pearl spotted. So like in the, you know, as in pearls that oysters make, pearl spotted. And are they preyed upon by eagles or larger owls? Um, yeah, I mean, other raptors would certainly would probably attack them um, if they could. Um, but it's quite interesting that they tend to, they're a more diurnal owl um, than any other species. So they, um, they seem to have a little bit of a, a niche split between themselves and other owls. Um, but I'm sure it's like any any of these species, if there's a bigger predator, um, there's a chance that, you know, they'll be taken by, by another owl or another raptor for that matter. 
so does the southern African zebra migrate to the salt pans every year like the east African zebra? No. So, I mean, in terms of migrations, um, most of the migrations within southern Africa have stopped. And the reason for that is fences. So the blue wildebeest migration of the Serengeti used to come all the way down to southern Africa at one point because of the animals are following the rain. Um, it's the same as the zebra migrations that you have um, kind of in places like Zambia. Um, but in southern Africa, because and in Botswana, um, because of cattle fences, um, and now obviously cities and all of these kinds of things, a lot of those migration routes have been cut off. Um, so historically, they would have been a migratory species, but now, um, you know, like within the Kruger National Park, for example, they'll move within Kruger, but they can't move more extensively than that. Great, thank you for addressing that. Um, so if I wanted to see many of these animals is there a particular time of year that's better to come down and visit yeah so i mean the probably the best time of year um for southern africa is kind of june through october so those are our well it's it's our winter into our early summer um and those months are really good because the bush is less dense so your visibility is be better um, and also water becomes less readily available so animals are forced to come to water sources to drink they can't just drink out you know in the middle of kind of nowhere um, so winter into spring um, in in the southern hemisphere are the better those are the best months to come Great, thank you, Lorraine. Unfortunately, that's going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to hand it back to you for closing comments. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say thanks to everybody um, for, for listening. And yeah, I hope that um, people learned a little bit about some of the animals that, um, that mean a lot to me. So thanks very much for the opportunity to share. And thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. So if you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.